break down the barrier between science and the public. Why? Because I found that scientific thinking is the most optimistic and productive of mindsets. The words critical thinking can have a negative connotation. But thinking like a scientist means believing that there are answers to our questions and that we are capable of pursuing those answers. And this is important as we face issues that affect our lives and our world. Preventative global health care actions. Careful use of our natural resources and their effect on our environment. Growing impact of neurological disease. Many people simply ignore these questions or avoid thinking about them deeply because they lack the confidence and the authority to even approach them. Now, we don't need everyone to put on a lab coat and go into the lab because you wouldn't all fit. But what we do need is an engaged populace, curious, thinking critically, asking questions, and thinking scientifically with us. How do we do this? How do we break down that wall? Well, we're actually all born scientists. As soon as possible, we begin, we begin actively figuring out how the world works. Think about a toddler. What's this? What does this taste like? Where does this go? And if I keep throwing my pacifier, will mommy keep picking it up to bring it back to me? Babies are full-time scientists, observing, testing, and exploring. And that exploration continues into early childhood. When I go into a preschool classroom for a science day visit, and I say, you guys are all scientists, they believe me. They dive right into the experiments that I've brought and they have the confidence that, yes, they are scientists. But over time, that self-identification as a scientist wanes because they stop exploring and they stop playing to figure things out. By the time I get to high school, very few kids think of themselves as scientists, and I'm betting the same is probably true for the audience. But your scientific mind is still intact, and you use it every day. A friend was telling me, and this is a friend who does not think of herself as a scientist. In fact, she says she's the opposite of a scientist. But she was just telling me that she finally figured out how to get her baby to go to sleep by trial and error, observation, and tracking the variables. And she optimized her grandmother's meatloaf recipe by testing and modifying and retesting and modifying again. We are all born with scientific minds. And that crucial, logical thinking style is a human trait. At your core, you're driven by the same thirst for knowledge and excitement of discovery that keeps Wikipedia growing and TED Talks with millions of views. But for some reason, we build a wall when it comes to thinking about and pursuing questions that we think of as traditional science. Now, I did not view myself as a scientist. I got Ds in high school biology. And I wasn't even interested until college when, in a neuroscience class, I asked a question, and I was just asking to figure out what was going to be on the exam. But my professor had the genius and the humility to say, I don't know. I don't think it is known. And you should do the experiment and figure it out for yourself. Science was alive, and I was invited to participate. It's that same invitation that I'm going to offer to you tonight. I'm going to show you how easy it is to become engaged. You're going to do some science experiments right there in your seat. And the goal is to show you that you can think about science, even neuroscience, which has an intimidating reputation. But with these experiments, you're going to start exploring how the world is represented in our brains and you're going to test those ideas yourself. The first principle is that incoming and outgoing information is organized in our brains in defined regions. This is where your movement information is processed. This is where your touch 
information is processed, and your hearing, and your vision. And for each of these regions, there is a map of your real world, the real world information laid out on the surface of your brain and contained within each region. Let's take the visual system. Your visual world is laid out like a map on the surface of your retina, which is at the back of your eyeball. So let's take my retina. Cells in my retina that are active by this point of light are right next to the cells that are activated by this point of light. And if I move across my visual field, I would move across my retina, activating cells in an orderly progression. And that order is maintained in the visual center of my brain. So there's a map of my visual world on the back of my brain. Now let's test that experimentally, not, not on me, but on you. So take your finger and gently press on the corner of your eyelid. Don't press too hard, and don't touch your eye, just your eyelid. Now, you should be pressing hard enough that you can see a spot or a shadow in the upper corner opposite your finger. As you move your finger up slightly, you can see that the shadow moves. So when you're at the top corner of your eye, the shadow or the spot should be at the bottom corner of your visual field. Now, you've just collected data that could help you map your brain. In this case, your retina, which is an outgrowth of your brain. See, very early in development, your eyes are actually part of your brain. And as we develop, they move out to their final position. So you are poking your brain and getting a visual perception. There's probably two observations you had from that experiment. The first is that there's an order. So as you moved your finger, the shadow moved in small increments, almost as if tracking your finger. But what you probably also noticed was that when you were poking the bottom, the image was at the top. And when you poked the top, the image was at the bottom. And same for right and for left. And that's really weird. It's weird that the map on your retina would be upside down and backwards. It's really weird until you consider the optics of your eye. There's a lens at the front of your eye, which is crucial for focusing light. But while it's focusing light, it does one more thing, which is to flip the world upside down and backwards. So light coming from this direction hits cells on your retina right here. And light coming from this direction hits cells on your retina right here. So when you were poking your eye, you were mechanically stimulating some cells in your retina that were on the lower right corner, and the image you saw was in the upper left corner, which was in the spot where light would normally come from to activate those cells. Even though you were stimulating mechanically, the perception was of light. The next principle of brain organization is magnification of important information. Your smartphone can give you a map of the whole world. But for detail, you have to zoom in a lot on a small region so that you can see the detail. Your smart brain also zooms in on important information. Let's take the touch system. This is the area where your brain processes touch sensation. If you take a brain slice from this region and turn it so you're looking at the front, you can see that your brain, that your body is laid out like a map. If I tickle your toes, this part of your brain activates. If I, tuckle, if I scratch your back, this part activates. And if I touch your face, this part of your brain activates. Now, one other thing that you can tell from this slightly creepy image is that some of the body parts are bigger than others. Um, <clears throat> we know from neurological recording in these regions that areas of your body that have really good touch sensation also take up more space in the brain. This is because areas like your hands and your face that, ha that collect and send a lot more detailed information to your brain also need more space in your brain to process this information. So there's a correlation between detail perception and space in the brain. And we can use that correlation to, pro to map the touch area of your brain. To measure detail perception, 
we will find the smallest point, the smallest distance between two points, where you're just able to feel two points and not one. So take your fingertips and push against the skin of your palm and increase and decrease the distance between the two points until you find a distance where you can feel two points and where smaller distances feel like one point. So for me, this is the distance. Now take these same measurements on your leg. You may find that you have to increase the distance on your leg a lot more than on your palm. For me, it's this distance right here. It should make sense that we don't need a lot of detail perception on the skin of our legs, so we don't use a lot of space in our brain to process that information. Now, if you had a couple more minutes and a partner, you could map several cases on your body and come up with a representation like this, where size indicates both detail perception and space in the brain. This is my touch map. You'll notice that my hands and my face are really large, indicating an ability to feel detail. And from what we know about detail perception and space in the brain, this, the area of my brain processing my face and my hands is likely much larger than my other body regions. But what's important here is that this exploratory process has helped you see that you can think about science. In just a few minutes, we've tackled some fundamental principles of neuroscience. You've tested hypotheses and made observations. You've even begun mapping your own brain. Now that you've begun to chip away at the wall, don't leave science to the scientists. Empower yourself to be engaged in your community by thinking about these crucial questions. Empower the next generation so that they can grow up to be scientific thinkers. You can start by going online and learning about the way your brain works. You can map your brain in brainmapper.org, or volunteer for citizen science, or just go home and talk to your friends about science and do experiments with them. Participate. Thank you. <laughs>